I'm sure that many of us have experienced this in our youth or at some point in our lives, but it's an interesting phenomenon that I think is worth exploring, especially in discussing the film I've chosen for this video. That discussion begins with a question that I wish to pose to you. Have you ever been scared of a horror film without ever actually having seen it? Its mere existence being a lingering presence of uneasiness in your life. I'm of the belief that horror becomes more effective when we form a personal connection to it. Our individual phobias can make something that seems like cheesy schlock to seemingly everyone else feel like meticulously crafted nightmare fuel to us. Going beyond the idea of an arachnophobe staying away from giant spider movies, there's an intriguing concept that I've observed many times in my personal life. There exists a fear that comes from a simple statement. We've all seen it before, a black screen during the opening titles or in the trailer where the text, based on a true story, or some variant of that statement, fades in. This phrase can be so powerfully transformative to a work of art. Attach it to some sappy biopic about a rock star or a politician, and everyone will say how they can't wait to see it because their story is just so inspiring. But stick it to the beginning of even the most uninspired and generic horror films, and there will be those who just straight up avoid going anywhere near the film because the events might have actually happened. I say might have because more often than not, the power of marketing is more effective than any of the scares the film can produce. As adults with access to the internet, we can now pretty easily find out just how much of a film's plot is actually depicting true events and how accurately. But when we were kids, things were different. At an impressionable age, we gain comfort from our elders that the fantasies that we see on screen or in print are just that, fantasies. Fictions crafted from storytellers that are then relayed to us in one medium or another. So I think this is why we have such strong reactions to the first time that we see that true story disclaimer come up. In the early 2000s, when I was in elementary school, I developed a fear and fascination with a certain horror film. Not only because it was the first time I was aware that horror could market itself as based on a true story, but also because that film took place in the state of Texas, where I've lived my entire life. This film scared the hell out of me before I even saw a single frame of it. It was more than just legendary in the annals of horror, it was a very local legend. Everyone knew about it, everyone talked about it, and everyone my age believed that it was totally real, and in some ways it is real, even though it totally isn't in others. So join me as I finally address one of the most influential works of horror fiction ever produced, not only for the entire genre as a whole, but for me personally. Let's talk about the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. My first exposure to the 1974 classic horror film came from conversations that I heard in the cafeteria in elementary school. At the time, the remake was coming out, and there were online advertisements and commercials on TV. This generated a certain amount of buzz around the original film, as well as reigniting a lot of the talk about the supposed true story. The advertisements had no problem hammering home the idea that it all really happened, and by this point the legend had made its way into the very DNA of Texas culture. Everybody seemed to be aware of the story like it had just happened yesterday. As an impressionable youngster with no real concept of artistic liberty yet, even the wildest statements sent shivers down my spine. I have very, very vivid memories of sitting in the cafeteria and overhearing the other kids talking about the movie and how the killer in the movie was still alive. They had arrested him, but he had escaped prison and was still out there somewhere. As silly as this may seem, I totally bought it. All I needed to hear was true story and Texas to lose sleep for about a month. It also didn't help that when I would catch glimpses of the original film on television or online, the film looked like it could have taken place in my own backyard. There's a tangibility to Texas Chainsaw that I think can only be truly experienced if you've grown up in rural areas like those depicted on screen. 
I've driven down roads like this, seen abandoned houses like this, and been to very old businesses just like this. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre terrified me because it took place in a world that I lived in every single day, and I didn't even get a chance to watch it until I was in my early teens, despite my best efforts to do so at even the young age that it first left an impression on me. Horror fans know what I'm talking about here. The more it seems like it's going to scare you, the more you want to watch it. I have always had an attraction to darker media, and while I was exploring that attraction growing up, slowly making my way down a ridiculously long list of horror films to tackle, Texas Chainsaw always set near the top of that list. When I finally had the opportunity to watch The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, there was a certain sense of finality that came over me. This film that had haunted my dreams before I even knew the details of the plot was finally in front of me, about to start. By this point, I was old enough to understand the artistic liberties taken with true stories, and my knowledge of filmmaking had expanded significantly. You would think that by this point, the effectiveness of the material would be affected by so many years of build-up in my head, that I might be underwhelmed when comparing the actual work to the carnage that I had imagined in my head for so many years. I'm pleased to report, however, that this was not the case. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre still holds up insanely well by today's standards, and almost 50 years of hype haven't hurt it in the slightest. Right off the bat, the film's story is only loosely inspired by a few real events that took place many years before the film was even dreamt up. Ed Gein is most widely credited with being the inspiration for many of the film's plot elements such as the fashioning of masks and household objects out of the skin of dead bodies. Gein is probably the real-life murderer that influenced classic films the most, with both Psycho and The Silence of the Lambs being inspired by his real-life crimes. A lesser-known source that directly inspired the film's co-screenwriter Kim Henkel were the crimes committed by Elmer Wayne Henley and Dean Arnold Corll. Murders that, unlike those perpetrated by Gein, actually took place in Houston, Texas. Despite the real-life inspirations, the events of the film, as well as the characters that experience them, are entirely fictional. If only I had done that research when I was a lot younger, maybe I might have actually slept soundly for a few nights. Although Texas Chainsaw is a work of fiction, the reason why everyone believes that it is a true story is because the film was marketed that way. The opening title crawl and narration intentionally misleads the audience into believing that what they're about to see is a depiction of real-life events. When asked why the film intentionally lied to its audience like this, director and co-writer Toby Hooper answered in a way that tied into the film's themes. He was angered by the fact that the government and media in the United States at that time was constantly lying to the public about national and international crises that were taking place the Watergate scandal, the 1973 oil crisis, and the atrocities of the Vietnam War were all weighing on his mind when he conceived of this dark, brutal story of senseless violence. I think that the lack of sentimentality in both the media of the time and especially nowadays affects how I see this film today. It's not a true story, yet it feels so real. It doesn't dress itself up as anything more than it is. There's this feeling of an ever-present threat from the first seconds that lasts all the way up until the film cuts to black. There's a cold disconnect that Hooper creates between himself and his depiction of evil. We don't learn much more than what's shown to us. We get the feeling that there's something to pull from this horrifying experience, but it's not for us to understand. Hooper straps us down and forces us into a blisteringly hot, disgusting world. A world that feels abandoned by the advancement of society, left alone to survive on the fringes. The cannibalistic family that's actually unnamed in this film, but would be later known as the Sawyers, are presented as they are, and are only fleshed out in our minds. We're left to wonder what drove them to such a state of depravity with only the tiniest hints as to how their ongoing human consumption operation functions. I've always seen the Texas Chainsaw Massacre as that brutal, horrifying headline that you read in a newspaper or online come to life. Like the story is cobbled together by eyewitness testimony with loose ends, descriptions of death and torture, and then an ultimately unsatisfying resolution that makes you at least glad that one person got out alive. 
it even begins with a date, like the one you'd see at the start of an article. There are many elements that came together to make Texas Chainsaw feel the way it does and caused many like myself to connect with it the way that we did. The low budget that required the use of a 16mm film camera gave the film its iconic, gritty look that enhanced the griminess of the subject matter. Behind the camera was, in my opinion, the secret weapon that made this movie. Cinematographer Daniel Pearl crafted some of the most gorgeous shots that I've ever seen in a horror film. Every pan, tracking shot, and angle feels so inspired and motivated by either the atmosphere of the scene or the action of the character. Daniel Pearl was so important to the look of this movie that he was contacted to actually come back and shoot the 2003 remake produced by Michael Bay, whom he had an established relationship with, having shot the music video for Meatloaf's I'd Do Anything For Love, which Bay directed. Pearl was known for shooting music videos, being the first ever winner of the MTV Cinematography Award for filming The Police's Every Breath You Take video. Staying in the realm of horror, he would go on to be the cinematographer for the 2009 Friday the 13th reboot. Pearl's incredible photography was enhanced by the genius production design work by art director Robert A. Burns. The iconic house is filled with animal heads, bones, furniture made out of human skin, face mask lamps, and a few chickens. Where the genius of Pearl and Burns meet is in the opening shot of the strung up body in the graveyard. The sun scorches the scene and you can almost smell the body burning as the wind kicks up the dust around it. Pair that with the flashbulb photography of the various body parts and John Larroquette's haunting narration, and you've got one of the best opening sequences in all of horror. When I saw this for the first time, I immediately knew that I was watching a masterpiece. The events of that day were to lead to the discovery of one of the most bizarre crimes in the annals of American history, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I made an entire video about how much the use of darkness can enhance a work of horror, but Texas Chainsaw is unique in that most of the carnage takes place in blistering daylight. It creates this sense of inevitability to the horror. Like, even if you stay out of those dark, scary places, in this world, there's nothing that can save you. Like the influential psycho before it, the lead characters aren't stalked by the killers. They accidentally stumble into their world a world where they make the rules. There's no sympathy from them, nor any of the locals. In Alien, no one can hear you scream because you're in space. In the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, it's because you're in the middle of nowhere, and even if your screams were heard, I don't think anything would be done to help. The Sawyers are isolated in a place of rural America where the slaughter of people is no different than that of livestock. It's simply how they survive. It's vile, simple, and completely devoid of relatability. Despite retroactively receiving names in the sequels, none of the family members are named here in this first film. They're simply known as Old Man, Hitchhiker, and Grandfather. Well, one of the family is actually named, and I think I've put off talking about him for long enough. Slasher villains become icons through a combination of multiple factors. Their signature weapons, costumes, and of course their masks make them the faces of their films and franchises. For me, the best of these slashers are born when their performers imbue them with certain personality traits that audiences can identify them with. Jason Voorhees, especially when portrayed by Kane Hodder, has this rage that comes through in his movements and brutal methods of killing. Freddy Krueger's wit and dark sense of humor couldn't be captured by anyone other than Robert England. And Nick Castle brought this vacant curiosity to the personification of evil that is Michael Myers. Despite predating all of the slashers that I just mentioned, Leatherface still manages to stand out from the crowd. Icelandic American actor Gunnar Hansen brought this character to life in a way that is still unique when compared to his contemporaries. Leatherface's motivations aren't born from hate or even a desire to commit violence or kill. Hansen portrays the character as someone who has an intellectual disability, that never learned to communicate properly, even visiting a special needs school in Austin to prepare for the role. 
Where Leatherface becomes interesting is, if you view the film from his point of view, he's simply defending his home from strangers that just barged in one day. Subtleties and nuances that Hansen gave him suggest that he's more afraid of everyone else in the film than they are of him. There's this great moment where he nervously looks around the house and sits by the window, clearly confused as to why his world is being invaded by these outsiders. It's kind of sad to see him so terrified of the other members of his family. You get the sense that the true evil of the family comes from the father, who forced his way of life onto his sons, and while one son truly enjoys what he does, I never got that from Leatherface. Leatherface wears multiple masks throughout the film, each made of human flesh and each representing a different personality and identity for the character that you can see him inhabit when he wears them. It's a very fascinating character that has been explored and theorized about just as much as the rest of the film has over the years. There are many opinions on what the messages of the film are and many interpretations of it have been given. One of the more interesting to me is the pro-vegetarian angle of the story. Toby Hooper himself stated that the film is about meat and the treatment of animals in slaughterhouses. Not only did Hooper himself give up meat entirely while making the film, director Guillermo del Toro actually became a vegetarian for a while after seeing it for the first time, the violence of the film shocking him so much. Funny thing about that violence, though. A lot of it actually happens off-screen and is implied, largely due to the lower budget restricting the special effects. The titular weapon is actually only used to kill one person in the entire movie, being used in another scene to dismember an already dead body. Again, what made Texas Chainsaw so effective was its realism rather than its gratuity. A lot of that realism is owed to its locations. A Hollywood backlot couldn't have captured the scale of these images. This is Texas. It was filmed in Texas and feels like Texas. I'm so familiar with these landscapes that when watching it, I always feel like I can step inside the film, like I can actually physically go to these places and experience the same conditions as the filmmakers. So for this video, I did just that. The gas station featured in the film is still standing today in Bastrop, Texas, and it was only a few hours from where I live. The owners have converted it into this awesome little attraction with actual props from the film, replicas, signed memorabilia, and tons of goodies for any horror fan to enjoy. They even serve barbecue there, which was pretty great, although considering the subject matter of the film, I did feel just a little uncomfortable enjoying it as much as I did. The gas station is a testament to the legacy of this film, not just as an internationally recognized piece of horror history, but as a great story with great local significance. Actually standing where they filmed pivotal scenes of this iconic horror movie felt cathartic to me. All these years of being terrified of and then fascinated by this seminal work of horror came full circle as I stood where these broke filmmakers in the 70s made history by scaring the shit out of Texans like myself. This movie scared me before I ever saw it, disturbed me when I finally watched it, and inspires me every time I watch it again. There's an effect that the Texas Chainsaw Massacre has that has secured its legacy today. There are, of course, the many sequels, my personal favorite being the second, due to its full commitment to dark comedy and for featuring Bill Moseley's Chop Top. The 2003 remake was actually pretty decent as far as horror remakes are concerned, elevated by the addition of Arlie Ermey and the return of Daniel Pearl behind the camera. In the survival horror video game world, I couldn't help but feel the influence the film had over Resident Evil 7, especially in the crazy family dynamic. Leatherface himself was featured as a playable fighter in Mortal Kombat X, which is just awesome. Just a few months ago, a new video game was released based on the franchise developed by some clear fans of the original film. I was actually told by one of the employees at the gas station that the game devs visited to take reference photos to get the location just right in the game. Ultimately, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre stands the test of time because of how real it made itself. No, it isn't based on real events that actually happened beat for beat, but that didn't stop it from becoming real to a community of Texans that included yours truly.
In a way, we're like the main character of Sally Hardesty, strapped down for the ultimate ride of brutalist southern horror, and like Sally, though we do make it out alive, there are those of us who are forever changed by the events of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. As I stood at the gas station and looked out onto that stretch of Texas road, I couldn't help but remember that final shot of Leatherface swinging his chainsaw wildly in the air as the sun rises behind him, silhouetting him as he forever cements himself in the annals of horror history, before the film abruptly cuts to black. perfect.